Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I can remember the first worship service I attended at New Hope with our family back in April 1999. I rode with our then pastor, John Avant, to both campuses. John was the main preacher, but he invited me to speak for 10 minutes and to invite people to come on mission. And I thank this church because over the next six years, until I became your pastor, more than 300 of our church members at New Hope came to England or Wales and went on mission. I'm so grateful for that. Everyone was very kind to us. It was a very sweet time. And John Avant did what he's so often done, preached very powerfully on missions. And I'll never forget the title that he had and the phrase that he kept repeating as we went. First of all, it was in the Stars Mill School for the South Campus and then back here at the North Campus. He kept saying, we are on mission with Jesus. We are on mission with Jesus. And I think that's a key phrase. And I'd love us to even speak that phrase out together, everyone, to say, on mission with Jesus. Do you think we can do that? After three, one, two, three, on mission with Jesus. And just so we get it, we'll say it one more time, on mission with Jesus. And so I want to say to New Hope in 2016, wow, the world has changed since that last century, that last millennium. So much has gone on, we won't even mention that. But let me say this, we have been on mission for the last 136 years, in fact. And in April 99, a fresh challenge there to be on mission. We have been on mission. And can I say this as well? We are on mission with Jesus Christ because you see, it's all God's work. In verse six, though we are encouraged to begin and carry on until the day of Christ Jesus, it's actually God who has begun this work. God begun the work at New Hope and God will keep it going as well and the gates of hell will not prevail it against it. We will not have total defeat. You will not have total defeat because Christ is Lord and Jesus is coming back and he is worthy of all praise. If you think so, would you give him praise right now? So we're on mission. We're on mission with a wonderful message of Jesus Christ and I, I want to say it very simply today. The Bible tells us that every single one of us is in great need of God because every single one of us has rebelled against the living God. That's just the state that we find ourselves in. And you, you say, Pastor, why is the world in such a mess? Because we've rebelled against the living God. But the wonderful good news of Jesus Christ is that God didn't just complain about us. In fact, he didn't at all. He still loved us. And he sent his only, uh, one and only son to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again from the dead. And the good news is that Jesus Christ is the solution to the problems of this world. And I encourage you to believe in him. Ask him into your life. Make a start with Jesus Christ. It's the best decision that I've ever made. It's the best decision that you can make as well. But let me tell you, when you once you come to know Jesus you actually end up being on that same mission with Christ as well. So we're going to look at being on mission with Jesus today. But first of all, we're going to look at some of the background stories. We're really storytelling for a moment at the beginning. And if you look at verse 1, it might just seem like a boring introduction. But in those days, the signature of the letter came at the beginning of the letter, not so much at the end. So it begins with letting us know who wrote the letter. Well, it's Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. And so the first story I want to mention is the story of Paul. 
We see it's Paul and Timothy, but let me just think about Paul right now. The conversion of the Apostle Paul is one of the great facts of the faith. The biggest enemy of Christianity, a hater of the name of Jesus, was converted. Isn't that awesome? The man who was trying to drag people into jail because of Jesus Christ met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. Paul had one destructive agenda before he was converted, and now he has a constructive agenda to make the name of Christ known. He was changed by amazing grace. And so once he was converted, once he was baptized and joined the church, he simply continued to be on mission with Jesus. And if you're saved, you're on mission with Jesus. Secondly, I want us to think about uh, this phrase here, to all God's people in Christ Jesus. Well, who were all God's people? Well, first of all, it was made up of people who had come to know the Lord. And a very famous Philippian that came to know the Lord was the jailer. The guy in charge of the jail was converted. We're going to tell his story in a moment. But he was gloriously saved. And I love it when God saves the most unlikely person. You know, I suppose I could say that I was an unlikely person to be a follower of Christ. Uh, my dad, my mum's here this morning, and my, my auntie Liz, and uh, niece uh, Ali. Can we give them a welcome this morning, everybody? It's nice to see them here. But uh, though uh, we had churchgoers in our family, but, you know, it wasn't really the British thing anymore uh, in the 70s to go to church. Church was a bit of a joke. And uh, I remember um, a couple of my relatives always used to say, uh, on a Sunday morning, that they were going to see the vicar. Well, that's the minister. They're going to see the minister. Well, it turned out they were actually going to, to the pub. I thought they were very spiritual men for a long time. Till uh, They were just going down to the bar or to the pub. And so it wasn't really uh, like the done thing for the men in our family to ever go to church. But God took hold of me. And I'd like to think that I'm an unlikely convert. And perhaps you are as well. That uh, none of us deserve this. But God grabbed hold of us and he saved us. Thirdly, I want to mention the story of the Philippian church. There they are again. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus in Ph Philippi. They made up of people like the Philippian jailer and all his family. And Lydia, a woman that we're going to hear about in a moment. They were just ordinary people. But you know what? They became part of something bigger than themselves. They didn't just come along as separate individuals. They became a people. God's holy people. I love that phrase. Gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ. And we also see that there were leaders, the overseers. Those were the, the ones with oversight, spiritual direction. And the deacons, which is a phrase for the servants, those that serve. Notice that the people are mentioned first, and then the leaders are mentioned. And perhaps that's a good order, because Philippians chapter 2 reminds us of the humble service of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to be humble servants. We call this a service, don't we? Are you going to the service? Well, it's not about um, me getting something. It's about each one of us serving the living God. And so the Philippian church became a serving community. And the last person I want to mention is Timothy, or if you like, Paul and Timothy. And while I'm giving this introduction, I kind of want to preach about Timothy for four or five minutes if I can, because I think this is a whole message in itself. Paul came to Europe with Silas. Paul rarely travels alone. He meets Timothy, bless you. He meets Timothy in Acts chapter 16. And it's also in Acts chapter 16 that Luke is mentioned. Luke starts to say, we... And they're called the we passages, which is when Luke includes himself in the story. This great historian says, well, I was there as well. By the time he writes the epistle to the Philippians, Timothy has become Paul's key man, his main next-gen investment. Timothy has grown and patiently begins serving, and he demonstrates his faithfulness for many years. I know it's just there, one word, Timothy, but I want us to think of the background story. Timothy's not after a job. He's not after a better living. He's not after a stepping stone. He has surrendered to the master Jesus and to his mission. He's on mission with Christ himself, spiritually crucified with Christ. Timothy proved himself by humble service. He was willing first to be a follower, not on condition of promotion. He wasn't itching for the limelight. He did that simply because it's right. That's what followers of Jesus do. Now, no doubt Paul had learned much from Timothy, but the world of the Bible understood the idea of the master craftsman and the apprentice who learns from him. The idea of discipleship is, first of all, to be a learner. That means we have to be taught doctrine. And Paul said to Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine. We have to be taught doctrine. We have to be taught what we believe. But this is the hardest thing, perhaps. We also need to be taught how to live as well. 
And that's where our pride is to get right off the table. We're fine being taught what we believe, but it's another thing to be taught how to lead, how to live, how to be, how to act. And that takes great humility. But let me tell you something, if, if you're a Timothy, if there's a Timothy in the room today, and you, you are humble, you want to be taught, you want to grow, you want to learn, let me tell you, it's a great place to be, it's a great blessing. I contrast his story sometimes with Apollos. Apollos is known as one of the super apostles. In fact, in the book, uh, to the first, uh, in the letter First Corinthians, I said First Corinthians and not One Corinthians. What's, what's happening to me living in, living in this nation? Um, in One Corinthians, let's get it right this time. <laughs> in One Corinthians, um, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Peter or Cephas, I follow Apollos. Apollos was, was such a, a kind of a big name that people even followed after him in a clique. He kind of had a big following. He was a very powerful speaker, very influential. But Apollos kind of just fizzles out. Whereas Timothy, not known for the same superstar qualities, uh, uh, probably a more shy person, more humble person. He was a Gentile, didn't have the same credentials. And I love it that by AD 60, the church is no longer raising eyebrows about different cultures and different generations mixing together. They just kind of got used to that idea. and, And John... Huff gave us a great word about that earlier today. But uh, if you contrast Apollos and Timothy, the world will probably say, Apollos is the man. He's got star quality. Timothy, he's kind of a little bit dull. What actually happened in in biblical terms, Apollos is a bit like a shooting star. He just kind of wanes and disappears. Whereas Timothy humbly serves, humbly serves. He's not after anything. He just humbly serves. And then eventually, Paul basically hands over the keys to Timothy. And when, when Paul is about to die in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, everyone's deserted me. We know Timothy's still there. And there were some that went on to other pastures, some left in anger. The apostolic team took a great hit. And as Paul is coming to the end of his life, it didn't look so strong. But let me tell you, humble Timothy may, may turn out to be one of the greatest spiritual leaders in human history. Because the church of Jesus Christ started to explode and grow. I wonder if it exploded and, grow and grew because of the humble service and the humble leadership of Timothy. Um, Mum, you remember it was uh, 1992. I'd, we'd been um, back in Timber for seven years. The church made me assistant pastor part-time and then full-time. And we did that for a few years. And then all the senior pastors left somewhere. So I was kind of holding the baby for a couple of years. And we had a time of real blessing there. And a lot of people said, well, we should be the senior pastor. People will always vote for who they know. You might have noticed that. And so they want to be the senior pastor. And I spoke to the superintendent who had no kind of uh, official authority over us, but I recognized a spiritual authority. And he said, it would be a good time for you to move on. And and, and so when someone counsels you that, it's like, um, you've got to die to self. It's not about what you want. It's about what God wants. Amen. And so that was a hard thing for us to leave Tinmouth in 1992, move six, six hours away. It's a tough thing to tell, tell your mom and your stepfather and, and to move on to, to uh, another place there. Uh, but I just want to say this, maybe I can say it to mom, we didn't leave out a choice. But because God called. And we didn't come here because of choice. But because God called. And I believe that Timothy didn't do what he did because of choice, but because God called him. And what we need in the church these days are not Apollos's who kind of want the promotion and the plaudits and, and everything. We need Timothy's who just are willing to serve. And let me tell you, my brother and sister, if you're a Timothy, you've got a noble office that you aspire to. If you think, by the way, brothers and sisters, that we need Timothy's in the church of Jesus Christ, would you give God praise right now? Give, every, give him praise. We sometimes sing, don't we? Where you go, I'll go. You know that one? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Let me tell you something. If, if God goes on mission with Jesus, you go with him. If he says stay, sometimes staying is the hardest thing because that means you've got to work through something. To stay in your marriage may be a lot harder in the immediate, but let me tell you, you will probably have much great blessing if you stay, hang in there, and be patient. We're on mission with Jesus. We have to be faithful with him. We need Timothy's who will be faithful. If you agree with that, give me another amen. And so, I, 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 thanks. 
I feel therefore there's a message in Paul and Timothy, and I've got to ask the question, are you on the team? Are you on mission? Are you in a, in a group? You know, we talk about being in a group. You've got to get in a group. Do you know something? If someone comes to our church and you don't get part of a small group, you have a 88% probability that you will not be in our church in two years' time because you'll just be coming along and you'll be disconnected. You've got to get, and we love it if you come along, but we plead with you, please get involved in a small group. That's how we care for each other. That's how we pray for each other. We can't tell every story from the front. We can't pray every prayer from the front, but we can pray a lot of prayers together. Are you in a group? Are you a learner? Are you humble? Today, are you humble? Are you humble? Are you patient? Do you have a ministry? Are you being obedient? Let me call you in Jesus' name to be a Timothy today. Okay, we're going to keep moving. I want us to look at the map of Philippi right now. You've got to have a map at the start of a message on one of the epistles. Philippi there is at the top of the map there. You see um, on either side, the top uh, to the right. Philippi has a proud past and was, was strong in the present. It was founded by the father of Alexander the Great. Not just like the greatest warrior ever, Alexander the Great, but his dad. And the people were very proud of that. Octavian and Mark Antony defeated Brutus and Cassius there. It was a famous battle site. It was like being called Waterloo or Valley Forge. You know, Philippi was mini Rome. It was strategic. And this little church almost didn't realize how God was going to use it in a mighty way because this was the first bridgehead into Europe. It was the very first time the gospel took place in Europe. The church had now become intercontinental, having moved from Asia now to Europe as well. Praise God that the church was learning right from the beginning. We've got to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so uh, I want us to turn now to Acts chapter 16 and see a couple more stories that gives us a picture of what it was like to be in this church. We want you to stay in this series as we make these introductions today. Maybe may God already speak to us as we tell these stories. Acts 16, and we're going to read verse 12, which says exactly what we've said already. From there we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days, says Luke. And then verse 13 is the first introductory story. On the Sabbath, we went outside of the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And I thank God for the sisters who are here today. Thank God for you ladies. You're awesome. We appreciate you. You're such a key part of our church. Your leadership is invaluable. We need you. God is going to do great things through the sisters. And if you agree with me, would you give God praise? And one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth, which was really expensive. She was a worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. May many open their heart to the Lord today. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So first, a person of peace Lydia opened the door, opened her own heart, and it opened the door to the gospel in Philippi. May we be people of peace that help the gospel door open. And then secondly, Paul meets a fortune teller in verse 16, which means she was kind of into Harry Potter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Sorry, it was just a joke. Sorry, Harry Potter. I've learned how to say it properly. Harry Potter, that's how you say it. Um... But she was into witchcraft and stuff, and so she was making a lot of money. And then Paul cast the demon out of her, and everybody got mad because the source of income dried up. Because that that was really at the heart of Philippi. It was a money-making machine. We don't actually know whether the lady was converted. We do know that she was set free so that if she heard the gospel, she could respond to it. But we don't know whether she became a part of the church. I hope she did. Maybe I'll meet her in glory and say, oops, I'm sorry. I told everyone at New Hope that I wasn't sure whether you'd be here. But uh, we hope that she came to know the Lord. And then one of my favorite Bible stories, it's a prison ministry story, and as a church, we love to go into the prisons and minister to men and women. Verse 23, after they'd been severely flogged, that's not why it's my favorite story, by the way, but uh, Paul, Paul and Silas were getting beaten up, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. I do need to say this. May God grant me and you the same commitment to Christ that even when things seem to be going wrong, 
we're in the stocks, we're in the inner cell of the jail, when it feels like our heart is breaking, our world is falling apart, I pray that we can keep singing a psalm, keep singing a hymn of praise to God, amen? If you want to do that yourself, can you praise God right now and say, yes, ahead of time, I will praise the Lord. I need that and you need that too. Verse 26, suddenly, you know, they're worshiping God, suddenly, there's this violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once, all the prison doors open, and everyone's chains fell loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword, was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And I want to say to someone, you may even be listening on the radio right now, don't harm yourself. If you're in trouble, you're in pain, don't harm yourself. There's hope. God is close by. In fact, this actually may even be an act of God to draw us near to him. And so the jailer called for lights, rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. And by the way, we don't believe just in declaring, we believe in discipling. If we proclaim the message of Christ, we need to become disciples as well. You can't separate the two. You can't disciple unless someone is saved. And if someone gets saved, they have to be discipled and to be taught about the word of God. Verse 33, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God. He and his whole household. What a great story. And so we've really laid the background stories as we've set the scene of the book of Philippians. And so what does God have for us today in the time that we've got left? Can we look back to Philippians chapter 1, everybody? So we're turning back to our main text, Philippians 1. And this is the message. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace means his undeserved mercy. It also means his great power as well. God's wonderful work in my life. And let me tell you something. If the work of God depended upon me, it would fail. I thank God that grace says it all depends upon God and therefore it will not fail. And though Satan desires my total defeat, I thank God that I have grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm an overcomer. I'm a more than conqueror because of the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul becomes personal, having talked about his own relationship with God, he now draws the church together, and church, let's be drawn together around his word. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He says, we've been on mission with Jesus together, Philippians. We're on mission, we've been on mission, we're going to go on mission and continue in partnership to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And then he says, being confident of this, Notice this Godward orientation, this God-focused phrase. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is a good work that God is doing in your life. It's a good work that he's doing in us. And it's all God's work. He began it, he will carry it on, and he will complete it. It's a wonderful God-centered focus that we receive today. But I'm going to suggest practically that we finish by... We finish it by mentioning some of the things, therefore, that we can join God in as we join him on mission. And here's the first thing we can join on. First of all, if God has begun the good work, Philippians 1 verse 6, if God has begun it, shouldn't we also begin? Yeah? If God has begun a good work, isn't it right to ask the question, well, have I begun with God? Have I started with God? You know, when I gave my life to Christ, I started with Jesus Christ. Therefore, I had to be baptized, become part of the church, and go on mission with Jesus. I had to grow in grace. I had to grow in Christ, grow in love and discernment. And when I stray, when I sin, I say, sorry, God, wash me clean, fill me with your spirit, make me more like you. You've got to begin, first of all, with Jesus Christ. Amen? The jailer began. Lydia began. The Philippian church began. New Hope Baptist Church began. I'm asking you the question, have you begun with Jesus Christ? My sense is that the, ma the vast majority of us today can say, yes, I've begun with him. Well, that's a good thing. The thing that was begun was God himself doing a good work in you. Do you realize that? It wasn't you in your own strength trying to do something, but God himself began a good work in you and I. 
Mum, it was actually the baptismal verse that Ian Burley wrote out for me when I was baptized at Timoth Baptist Church, 1979. He wrote out on our baptismal certificate, Philippians 1 verse 6. And I used to follow the same practice in the UK as well, would always write a different verse for each candidate. He chose that one. Perhaps he realized that I was a, a special work of grace. I especially needed to know that, but God had begun a good work in me. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But secondly, shouldn't we also carry on? If God has begun a good work that he will carry on, if God began a good work in me that he's going to continue, carried on, shouldn't I also carry on with Jesus? Amen? If that work has begun, and if I've begun with him, I'm supposed to follow through on that one. And so, brother and sister, are you as passionate as you were about sharing Christ as you were 10 years ago or 5 years ago? Are you as enthusiastic for Bible study and prayer as you once were? Well, if not, well, let's just get reorientated to Christ today. Remind ourselves, he began the good work, and so he's also doing a work in me that he wants to carry on. Not so that I get to the end of my life and I'm like, oh, please, please, you know, can I just make it home? I hope that we can actually hit the tape at our very best at the end of our lives. Let's carry on. Well, say, Pastor, how do I carry on? What do you mean by that? Well, verse 2, we carry on with grace and peace. We began with grace and peace. We carry on with grace and peace. We don't get saved by grace and then live the rest of our life by works, right? We're saved by grace and we carry on with grace as well. So let's carry on with the grace of God. Secondly, with prayer. I always pray with joy. And I call you to the prayer meeting tonight. We had a brilliant time last time we did this. Six o'clock at our rainbow room for an hour and a half. We're going to assemble together with prayer. I know, I know that uh, there's football on TV. I know there's great competition around us, but I'll tell you something at the end of your life, the, the real significance in your life is going to come from the prayer meeting, not from the NFL. And then 30, partnership. Carry on in partnership. We need grace and peace. We need prayer. We need partnership. That means we've got to get on with people. We've got to be team players. We've got to work together. We've got to assemble together. We've got to be on the team together. Fourthly, love love. We need the spirit of love in this place today. Amen. Everyone say love. Verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Affection. Say affection. I didn't say infection. But we're supposed to be affectionate to each other. Not too affectionate in that way. Greet each other with a holy kiss, but there's supposed to be some tenderness. William Barclay says on this passage, through this passage, Paul breathes the warmth of his affection for his Philippian friends. Verse 9, that your love may abound. Everyone say abound. That your love may abound more and more. That means it grows. And it gets better. It gets stronger. I think sometimes people think like, well, you come to church, you go to a new church, and it's like buying... Buying a brand new car, it's like a Ferrari, it feels great, this is a great church, love this church, awesome church, I want to do everything. And then the years go by and you get a couple of knocks, you get a couple of bumps, you get a couple of dents, and then you, you're driving an old banger. Well, I don't think it's supposed to be like that at all, that's the wrong picture, it's actually a picture like of a growing tree that, that grows and grows, matures, and then grows fruit. We're talking about one of our uh, longest standing members, Carl and I, as we were driving up together, and I, I see that dear brother in Christ just bearing fruit. We, um, uh, I, I asked people how long they'd been married at the South Campus. I can't even remember why. But, but Mr. King, uh, uh, I asked, said, said, Mr. King, how long have you been married? 70 years, he said. And that there's a joy actually in abounding in love going on. You've got blessings around you. Well, that's the picture of the church. We're not an old banger. We're actually called to be abounding in love. Amen. And so if we don't abound in love, what do we need to do? We need to abound in love. How do we do that? It's by the grace and power of the Lord Jesus Christ giving us a fresh start. It's not saying, well, you offended me, you offended me. Fresh start in Jesus' name. Amen. Fifthly, discernment. So that you may be, be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day of Christ. How do we carry on? We carry on with discernment. We carry on with our eyes open. Hearts of love, but wisdom. We need to be wise about what we believe and what we get into, what we let into our homes. We have to make wise judgments about things around us. Philippians 1.15 says, Some preach Christ out of goodwill, uh, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, and others out of goodwill. We need to know who preaches Christ out of goodwill and who preaches Christ out of envy and rivalry. There's a difference between the two. Now there's grace even in this passage as well. Some have mixed motives. 
We need discernment. I need to share this story that after the resurrection and Peter had been restored to be with Jesus, Peter, there's, a, there's an interesting moment right at the end of John's gospel when, when Peter goes, Lord, just him and Jesus. He goes, Lord, what about him? What about him, Lord? And what does Jesus say? Jesus goes, never mind about him. Just make sure that you're right, Peter. Just make sure that, you, that you're serving. And I think we live in a culture that says, what about them? We compare ourselves to others. What about him? What about them? What about her? Never mind them. Never mind her. Love them with the affection that you have. But make sure that you and I are discerning and carrying on so that thirdly, we trust God to complete the work, being confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Satan wants you to fail. He wants total defeat in your life. God wants total victory, and he promises, his word promises me, he promises us on our 136th anniversary, being confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Yeah, I was cheering for Georgia last night. Uh, it was nail-biting stuff. They, they win when it's four and ten, on fourth and ten, and uh, I think I said that all wrong, but you know what I mean. And, and uh, so Georgia win, but like, it would have been much easier watching it if you already knew they were going to win, right? The nice thing is that we happen to be watching this video of life knowing that we are on the winning side, that we cannot lose. We, we win in the end, amen? We win in the end, amen. I said last week, I, I can't remember if I said last week or not at this campus, but uh, I heard a preacher say the other day, Satan's like, like uh, got one of those things around his neck that says, help, I've fallen down, I can't get up. You know, but in, 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 he's fallen down, he can't get up, but in Jesus' name, we have the victory, amen. Praise him one more time that we have the victory this day.